Hey y'all and good now whenever and wherever this finds you. Well tomorrow I'm going camping for a few days and I hope to come back with some insight. Actually maybe not. We're not going to the desert. We're going up in the mountain uh, near Julian. I thought I might talk to me in front of you uh, before I go because I'm realizing now that all this technology, all it, the creativity and the ability to create it's going to flood consciousness, the psychiatrist, with so much content that you're really only going to have time for your own. And so it is going to be about creating your own reality and living in that life of your imagining. I was thinking about, I'm going to be leaving the planet soon. What's up going forward? And of course, I won't be here, but I'm wondering, what am I leaving? And I'm leaving a mess uh, of my room and my planet. And I consider it an opportunity for those coming along to have uh, work. Work? <laughs> Y'all don't remember, but that was from the Dobie Gillis show. Maynard G. Krebs, and uh, he became Gilligan on Gilligan's Island. But anyway, I digress. This is more for me than for you. And there's all the talk about AI, and I, I really enjoy AI, and it just helps me to feel more creative and more alive. And so there's a lot of fear about it, and I watched a video on Singularity, and I watched a video on text-to-video, and all the different things that are going to be possible. And, you know, the thing is, AI and robotics is going to replace what we've been doing as a form of earning money, and that's not going to be available anymore because corporations, their biggest cost is human labor, and if they can avoid human labor, they're going to. And of course, they look at it in terms of windfall profit, and I look at it in terms of net zero. <laughs> uh, that it's going to, they're just, it's going to be so cheap. They're going to have to make it available to all of us at prices we can afford, whatever that means. And that brings me to the idea of money. And I've been working on getting away from money. And I heard something that helped me today. And it's like, instead of money is currency. And if I see money, if, if, if I quit looking at money as something that's stagnant, held, hoarded, and controlling, and I look at it as a currency, a flow, uh, like everything in life is a flow. And so with currency, it can be backed up by a current of electrical power. There's just so much that we can do. But I think really the currency is about the flow between humans. And so let's just make um, what we do a measurement between each other and uh, let AI help us keep track, if that's necessary. I mean, uh, the only reason I would want to keep track is so that I know that everybody's getting a fair share. It is a bountiful universe, and it's so wonderful. And then the other thing about work, work, cleaning up the mess. AI can't clean up the mess. Because the mass is our disconnection between humans and the earth. And to reconnect to the earth means that we need to be hands-on, uh, nurturing, working, in cleaning, um, nurturing, and helping um, revitalize what the planet does best on its own. And the planet just produces. I mean, the sun produces, the planet produces. For so long, 
people who figured out how to take advantage of that and hoard it away from us so that it's not a universal gift. I lost my train of thought, but... And then the other thing is, I was thinking about some years ago, and it's been many, actually, when you live for a long time, you can have many times of many years ago. I mean, it's limitless of memories are limitless to remember when I became a citizen of the world and I had citizen of the world t-shirts and I realized that my father was in the military and he was relieved of his military duty because of his mental instability. Then he became a employee of the Department of Corrections in Florida, and he worked himself up to the position of uh, pre-release manager, and uh, that's where when nonviolent inmates that have proven themselves to be safe and returnable to society, six months before their release, they were taken to town and given jobs, or they could go to the junior college. And then it, they would go home to prison at night. You know, that turned into the three strikes you're out law. You know, it was like 10 soldiers and Nixon coming and his paranoia was fed into the side guys to the country. And that then followed up by Reagan, who really put that on steroids and, uh, and then even when we came to Bill Clinton and the the cops on every beat or whatever the fuck they were talking about, you know, lock them up. And it's really mostly the poor. And now they admit the war on drugs was a way to stop the movement of the time, which was a lot of the people that were feeling the, the want for change, <laughs> like drugs I mean what's not to like um you know I mean I took it to the limit and I had to jump off the boat because it was like I was truly on the road to nowhere and um you know I'll be honest I when I started doing drugs I told myself, if I ever get to the place where I can't pay my bills, I'll quit. And 15 years later, I woke up one morning and I had spent my rent money on drugs and I couldn't pay my bills. And of course, rather than quit, I decided to die. But before I died, I thought, well, I did have a two-year-old son at that time. He lived in a far away, but uh, he called me. It reminded me to have something to live for. And then I got his mother on the line and found out about a psychologist that I could get some help from and told them, I know there's something wrong with me, but I don't know what it is. And they told me, well, until you quit medicating it, you're not going to know what it is. And when I quit medicating it, it turns out that I have uh, bipolar and major depression. And it turns out that I'd been medicating it all those years. And it was working, except for the cocaine. From cocaine to Rogaine. I mean, it's like that drug is to be chewed as a leaf, as a stimulus. But to put it in powder form and then ultimately to put it in crack form you know a little i don't know they call it crack because i don't know crack it balls that shit was gnarly man it's like you i'm feeling it right now you just you, you take off and no sooner than you get off and you want to do it again it wasn't enough you want more it's to it's driving your bus and you'll do anything to do it because you're not thinking right. I mean, I thought that I could spend my money, buy some drugs, sell the drugs, get uh, enough to make some more crack, 
and we bought the drugs and made the crack. <laughs> and I woke up with nothing. I would suggest that uh, if you want a trip, that's fine. Just stay safe. Um, pot's cool for depression, and it's just fun for euphoria and recreation. I don't like drinking. Um, it always seemed like a downer. And speaking of downer, my favorite one was Quaaludes. And there was a year that Quaaludes came to town and there wasn't a car in town that didn't have a den in it somewhere. I mean, it was bumper cars, man. It's like, holy cow, what a trip that was. And, uh, and it's like, I was married at the time, and my wife, she didn't like pot, and she didn't drink, so I had a designated driver when we went to the parties. It was great. Well, it turns out she liked quaaludes. We had done some quaaludes, and we were driving home, and she just like, I don't want to drive anymore, and she just lays down in the seat, puts her head in my lap, and it's like, whoa, we're going like 30 miles an hour, and she just gives up. I clearly am here today to tell you the story, so it must have worked out. But what an adventure. Back to what I was talking about. What, What is the world now today? And it's, oh, and then back to being a citizen of the world. I've been watching and studying and owning the hard truths that, you know, like I say, my father was in the military. And we thought that was a good thing because they just defeated the Nazis in Germany. And it was all like, yeah, military's great. We won the war. And then Eisenhower warned us about the military industrial complex and, and it did take over. But anyway, I don't need to figure this out. We all know what happened. The military was controlled by the corporations and the corporations wanted to dominate and have um, cheap materials and other people's stuff. So we went about the world. If you ever get a chance, read the book, The Confessions of an Economic Hitman, and he'll tell you what they did. And there was a method. And they would go to the leaders and they would say, look, here's the deal. You can go along with us or we'll topple you and you can have immense fortune and surrender the control of your country to us or we'll kill you. And that for a lot of people was a deal they couldn't refuse and when they did, they killed them. <laughs> and it's like realizing that we're an empire built on war and you know have i could look it up but it's 200 and something years and of those years only 37 weren't at war what's cool is the rest of the world hasn't been at war we vilify them as if they are at war but they're not they're basically defending themselves from us. And, you know, we talk about their military. I mean, we sent $100 billion to Ukraine and Russia's military budget's less than $100 billion a year. So, you know, we talk about China building up their military. <laughs> they surrounded us with many military bases. If there was bases along... Mexico and Canada border, you know, we might uh, have a different feeling ourselves. So, but the good news is they're ignoring us and they're coming to each other to rather than be uh, a victim of our hegemony, they're deciding to come together as allies and prosper together. And that's different. And that's the transformation that we're looking for. That instead of 
being adversaries, we become collaborators and we work for the good of all of us. And it's just like, you know, China and Russia are working with Africa and South America to improve their infrastructure. And in return, they want strong economic partners. It's different. I mean, yeah, they're still creating a network, but they're not doing it through control. And they're not telling these countries what they need to do. You know, they make a bargain for their resources rather than just taking them. So it's win-win. Where before, when the empire was trying to control the world, it was a lose-lose. A very few winners on the very tip top. And they've managed to get control of all of it. I find it frustrating sometimes to have this outlook of the future and a brighter world for everyone. And talk to the people that are still in this paradigm of thinking that somehow we can fix this shit. And not just make a major shift from this mindset of scarcity and adversarialism to one of prosperity, togetherness, and abundance. I mean, it's really so simple. And then you live the life of your imagining. I know. I have a fixed income and, a, and an exciting life sitting in a chair looking out my electronic window. And so I talked to three or four of you through these videos, but I realize I'm talking to me and it's got me smiling and feeling good. And that's the world of my imagining. And so I hope that you could have enjoyed this as much as I did. And I will see you down the road. If you're a watcher, I'll see you down the road.